What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What's up, Rebels? Welcome back to Rebel Radio. I'm your host, Josh Levine. Today's guest is Sasha Jenkins. He is a leading mind chronicling the evolution of hip hop culture, punk rock, graffiti. He's the editor of Mass Appeal. He was one of the founders of Ego Trip, the uh, magazines, books, TV shows. He's also a documentary filmmaker. If you haven't seen Fresh Dressed, it's great. You need to check it out. Sasha's gonna give us some great lessons from his career, like how he's learned not to be afraid to fail, as well as some things not to do in partnerships. He's got some good stories about his, his partners along the way and, and what all of that has taught him. Do all that, and right now, listen to this interview with Sasha Jenkins. Let's just get into it. Tell but me what you uh, want to do? No, you know, we, we um, you know, you know, I'm a fan of your work. And uh, as much as, you know, we've been friends for 20 years, something like that now. I remember walking you into, was it Danielle Smith's office? Dude, you got Vibe? me, you got me hired at Vice. At Vice? At Vibe. Yeah, yeah, no, I can't, I can't. You got me hired that. at Vibe and uh, got me my, my, uh, Method Man interview. I remember the photo. It was in the center of the, the page, I think, and it was like Method Man surrounded by clothing or something. I don't. Yeah, I don't that know. sounds right. That sounds right. That was when Vibe was cool. I don't yeah. know. It hasn't been cool for a minute. I, I you know, I gotta be honest. I, I'm not sure I knew that it was still around. It is, I believe, uh, online. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if they they do a print version, but they. Oh, okay. It's yeah. still online. Yeah, that's. That's the way it goes now. Yeah, but dude, but so you know, we're um, you're like the perfect person for this show, because you know you've built an amazing career, and you're not just one thing. You got many hustles happening, and uh, and and you make it all work. So we want to learn how you do that. Okay. And um, so, but I want to start back at the beginning, because I know so so you're an author, filmmaker musician, um, and much more, journalist, publisher, all that stuff. It um, happens. It goes down sometimes. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, how did you how'd you get into this stuff in the first place? How did you even get into music? Well, going all the way back, I come from a background of uh, culture has always been at the forefront of my family life. You know, my dad was a television producer and a filmmaker and yeah. african-american cat from from philly my mom was from haiti but mm. she was also a painter okay um so at a young age i was exposed to the idea of art as not only expression but art as culture that's connected to identity mm. you know for instance you know uh there's there's a haiti has a very distinct distinctive painting style okay. haitian artists have a very uh uh, specific style that is recognizable by people who know art or people who are fans of the art and mm-hmm. my mom comes out of that tradition people are used to seeing these sort of Haitian street scenes and you know Haitian life my mom because of what my father was doing as a filmmaker and television producer they were traveling the world yeah so my mom's is her lens her look at Saudi Arabia was what she saw, but it had this Haitian, this very unique oh, Haitian wow. perspective. Okay. You know, uh, how she saw Lebanon. You know, my sister was born in Lebanon. Um, my mom painted that. Mm-hmm. Um, and my dad did documentary films and television and all this other stuff. So at a young age, I was exposed to the idea of culture as commodity, as identity, as something that's very important to human life. Yeah. And just on a very just random tangent, in the 70s, Life magazine used to do these like kind of best of 
there's a classic best of like Life magazine bound version. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. That had like all annual. these photographs of like World War Two, you know, yeah. D Day, yeah. you know, all these like really arresting images, and I would just stare at those photos, you know, yeah. um, and it would take me places, and it, it would make me ask questions and want to go to different places, you know, not only through expression but through travel, and so. Mm -hmm. I'm painting this like really beautiful picture of this, you know, family life and creativity. Sure. The truth is, like, I guess like half of the marriages these days, you know, my parents split up when I was about six years old. So yeah. we were living in uh, Silver Spring, Maryland, and my dad was teaching at Howard University at the time. So my parents split. He moves to New York, and maybe about a year or so later, we followed suit. Mm. You know, he moved to Harlem. I moved to Queens. Okay. And, you know, outside my window, uh, there'd be loud music playing. And my mom was always the, the lady who would call the police and be like, <laughs> you know, they're playing music too loud. Yeah. But what she didn't understand was that was the birth of hip hop. Right. And actually, these DJs called the Disco Twins. Mm -hmm. Before that, they were called the N-Word Twins who go back to as early as 1973. All those guys in the Bronx know who they are. Mm -hmm. um, that's who was spinning outside of my window. So at a young age, music was just a part of, you know, uh, our expression. It was sure. a soundtrack to, you know, there were park jams, and people playing music outside. You know, this simple idea of what hip-hop was then no one knew that it would become what it became. Mm -hmm. So I had access to these things. And then so I'm experiencing like graffiti and break dancing and all these things. And I'm going home and my mom, although she doesn't understand it. And at first she was graffiti, like drove her nuts because I was getting in trouble. Right. She saw that there was creativity in it and she encouraged me to like explore it. Cause she saw the art in it. Mm -hmm. So to me, my connection to music is simultaneous to my connection to the culture that I was experiencing as a kid on the street. And sure. then, you know, we came from Maryland. My sister's six years older than me. You know, she liked quote unquote white boy music. And I would dig in her records. And first I discovered Jimi Hendrix and I discovered the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and, and yeah. all this other stuff. That I that I liked, mm -hmm. and so uh, coming from this background of folks understanding culture, I was just very open to lots of different modes of expression that involve art and music and culture. Mm -hmm. So, how heavy know. how heavy did you get into that stuff? Was it like was it was that your thing like that was consuming you or, or what, how, how heavy did I get into like, what like graffiti and, and music like was that well I, I I noticed that I, I don't you know you know my wife jokes that maybe I'm on some kind of spectrum but when I get obsessed with something I get really obsessed with it right yeah. so graffiti was pretty much an obsession until recently I've finally just Actually, I kind of hate it now, but it was an obsession for for many years as yeah. a kid, so much so that, you know, in the fifth grade, I had an art teacher. You know, this is New York City public schools. You're black, you're big. People just assume you're going to be a troublemaker. Mm -hmm. I had a copy of Henry Chalfont's book, Subway Art, which is mm -hmm. a seminal book on, you know, subway graffiti and all this other stuff. The teacher saw that I had an interest in graffiti. He saw the book. He said, listen, man, if you just stay back here and look at your graffiti and draw, I'll just give you an A. Just don't give me a hard time. So when you think about the idea of this, this teacher just letting me completely engulf myself in this culture that was tangible to me mm -hmm. because it was being done, and even though I wasn't a documentarian at that time, I wasn't a notable graffiti artist or anything. I was nobody, but I I really connected with the power of what it meant to be doing something you're not supposed to be doing 
that also had the potential to be beautiful and speak to your identity. Now, I'm sure. saying all this lofty shit now as an adult, but I think in the back of my mind, I realized that. But then when you think about two years ago, I wound up doing a book with Henry Chalfant. Mm -hmm. And you think about in 94, Henry Chalfant was the guy who gave us a loan, a personal loan to start Ego Trip. Right. You think about the power of the mind and the power of when you're really wholly consumed by something, there's there's an energy and a power that sometimes you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's luck and doors open, but if you can channel that energy and run through the door, you know, the possibilities are endless. Yeah. Did you, how how aware were you of that at the time? I mean, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. But I, I look at lots of things in my life that have happened. Sure. You know, I was a huge fan of the Bad Brains. Mm -hmm. um, I wound up interviewing, you know, Daryl Jennifer, who was the bass player. I tell this story all the time. He hates when I tell it, but he was kind of an asshole to me. Yeah. And not because he wanted to be an asshole. He was probably having a bad day. I mean, I you know, maybe I said something to him that threw him off. I'm not above being a dumbass. Mm -hmm. But... He was in the middle of cutting an album, a pretty serious one. He was at Electric Ladyland Studios, and, you know, there's a lot of intense history connected with his band, and who knows what he was going through that day, so who the fuck am I calling him up, asking him, you know, annoying questions? Uh -huh. So I, I did that interview. I'm like, wow, man, my hero, like, you know, I don't know, shitted on me. And then some years go by, and there's a new record that's coming out. It's these lost demos, these lost Bad Brains demos that... um. Actually, Adam Yauch from the Beastie Boys had played for me some time before that. And um, I had the opportunity to to interview Daryl again. So I, I I did, and this time we hit it off. Mm -hmm. So much so, he's like, man, if you want to, you know, I said, man, I'd love to write a book about you guys, whatever. He said, come hang with me in Woodstock. You yeah. know, he didn't know me from a can of paint. He was going right. through like a divorce and all kinds of shit. And we hung out, and he played me some new music he was doing. And I was like, man, this is great stuff. I know a label who would probably really like this stuff. Mm -hmm. So I got home to New York, and I called my friend Jarrett Meyer, who started Raucous Records. And I was like, hey, man, do you know the Bad Brains? He's like, do I know the Bad Brains? like one of my favorite bands of all time. I was like, yo, the dude Daryl has some hot shit. That was on a Monday. Mm. Tuesday, Daryl comes down. This is before Raucous becomes huge. They cut him a check on the spot. Wow. And he winds up recording a bunch of music that never came out. You know, when they got their bigger deal with, uh, I forgot which parent company, if it was Universal or whatever, they opened up a budget again and he recorded all the stuff. Uh, one song he did with Most Def, which is a precursor to Umi Says, mm -hmm. which is a, one of Most Def's most beloved songs. He had done a somewhat similar song with Daryl that no one ever heard. Wow. So, and then you flash forward to some years later uh, and I'm in a band with him called the White Mandingos, mm -hmm. you know, with, uh, with a rapper from the West Coast named Murs, mm -hmm. who's a really talented guy and who didn't know me from a can of paint and we had mutual friends. A voice in my head told me, call Murs because he would, he's an artist based on how he moves, who understands rock, is not intimidated by it, understands the audience, and probably get it. And mm -hmm. I call him up, and I say, man, you don't know me from a can of paint. My name is Sasha Jenkins. He's like, I know who you are, you know, Ego Trip. I was like, yeah. Do you want to be in a band with me with Daryl from the Bad Brains called the White Man Dingoes? This is over the phone. He says, okay. That's great. You know, who does that? Yeah. And so a big part of what I do and it's I'm not special I'm sure everyone's this way but I articulate it by saying there are voices in my head that tell me to do certain things and I try them and sometimes I fail a lot of times I fail. No everybody's not that way because most people listen to the voices then that tell them not to do those things but there are voices telling them to do something yeah for sure but we're all having it. conversations all day yeah but I get something in my gut and the voice tells me to do it and I try it. And I've, I've failed. It, ha it happens. But that's the secret. If you're afraid to fail, you're never going to win, ever. So does that um, – how, how much does it bother you when you fail? 
But as I get older, um, as I've gotten older, it doesn't bother me as much. You know, it's it sounds corny, but it's failing is is great because you learn from it. Right. Success is great. You know, going back to like, well, you do you do all these things. How do you do it? For me, it's always about a team. Mm -hmm. For me, it's always a collaborative process because I might be maybe let's say I'm on some kind of ADHD spectrum or something. I get really depressed if I'm not doing. I enjoy doing lots of different things, and okay. I get depressed if I don't do it. But then, I'm even more depressed if I'm doing it by myself because it's impossible. Yeah. So, how do you find partners to create these these ideas to bring these ideas to life? Who are the most the best possible partners to help you do what you want to do? Mm -hmm. And that's all it is. I mean, if you look at most of the stuff I've done, uh, I, I'd say a lot of the ideas come from me, mm -hmm. but my ideas get better often when I collaborate with people. So that's great. So I want to I want to dig into that. Um, but uh, why do you hate graffiti? You're uh, not the first person on the show to say that. Uh, well. Like, uh, I, I can speak specifically for New York City. Like, I, I'll say Los Angeles. I have a lot of respect for what Los Angeles has done. You know, a crew like MSK, um, these these guys have been super organized for the longest and do shows and yeah. do amazing illegal stuff. And But they come from a culture of walls and freeways. And, you know, it's different from what we had in New York. In New York, we had subways, right? Mm-hmm. Before the subways, you had people writing graffiti on the streets in the late 60s, early 70s. But eventually all that stuff largely was concentrated on the trains. And right. because there was limited space on the trains, it went from signatures to more elaborate stuff. There was a level of competition, right, that yeah. these, these kids were competing with one another from different boroughs to have style, mm -hmm. to be distinctive, to stand out for respect. And when you consider there were some pieces that ran on trains for like, eight years you know that's respect that's yeah. that's like there's, there's an aesthetic there, there there's history there's legacy um so the, the subways are gone and so now you have this you know street graffiti which is fine there's graffiti on the streets before there was subway graffiti but you have a lot of guys who aren't from new york mm -hmm. who are quite frankly in it doesn't. It's. It doesn't necessarily boil down to race because the 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 guys. New York was a melting pot, and they were white, black, green, orange kids right. writing early on. Yeah. But now you have white, ki not white kids, white men in their fucking mid to late thirties, who, um, move to places like you know, uh, like Bushwick. You know, these neighborhoods that are quickly becoming gentrified and then they spend their days doing illegal graffiti, writing on shit and to them, like keeping it real is bombing. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go to the hood and bomb. But like, sure. dude, you moving to the fucking hood is displacing the motherfuckers who actually pioneered this shit that you're saying us New Yorkers aren't fucking keeping it real anymore. Mm -hmm. And because New York fell off. You can just fucking skip around New York City and then call out other graffiti writers and then threaten other graffiti writers and saying they're not keeping it real. Dude, you're not even fucking from here. Right. So not only are you a gentrifier uh, on the level of um, community and neighborhood, you're a fucking gentrifier of culture. Mm. And fuck you, you know? And on top of that, there's cameras everywhere. On top of that, New York is so gentrified that it just looks different. Like graffiti almost looks like out of place. Right. New York has changed so much. Don't get me wrong. Like I think um, freight train graffiti actually to me is a legitimate form because mm -hmm. uh, there are people from all walks of life who paint these trains and they travel and like mm -hmm. there's a level of communication that exists. Yeah. The shit that happens in New York on the streets, I can't speak for L.A., but it's just fucking corny to me. Interesting. What do you think? I mean, you know, the, it's easy to, to pick on New York, and we're having it out here in San Francisco with the, this, you know, gentrification. 
you know, there's a lot of discussion about what that means for like daily life, um, good and bad, obviously. But what what is the impact that that is having on culture? I mean, to use graffiti as an example, like graffiti, developers love it because what happens is they tap into the artists who can do the pretty stuff. Mm-hmm. And they build these buildings and they, they, they commission them to do right. the art. Or they encourage the, the graffiti, the, the nice stuff to, oh, and the street art to kind of live in these, envir- in these areas because, mm-hmm. you know, it's quote-unquote aspirational. And it's, it, 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 graffiti's been commodified. So it's like, oh, this famous artist who sells his paintings for $25,000 is right. doing a mural. He did a wall. The value of the neighborhood sure. goes up. Yeah. In the, the in my neighborhood, my mom still lives in this in this building. When I was growing up, not only were the park jams, but years later were the crack jams. Mm-hmm. Like the the park jams, the park was completely decimated. This is back when like uh, two liter bottles were glass. Mm-hmm. Like when we were kids, we would just break two liter bottles because it was just was powerful. This park was just run down after the park jam stop, and people would sell crack now right behind that park there's a bunch of walls because there are it's where they park these school buses right Mm -hmm. now outside of that same window the uh there's a community garden right yeah where people bring the fucking compost nothing wrong with that right but no one no one in the projects is necessarily getting down with that and then all those walls are painted now by Legendary graffiti and street artists, many of them my friends, to mm-hmm. be honest. So on one hand, it's amazing to look out my mom's window and see all this amazing art. But on the other end, I know what it's doing. It's it's changing the complexion of the neighborhood. It's changing the value of the properties. It's changing the way politicians and people who have money to spend mm-hmm. are viewing the community. Mm-hmm. That's what it's doing. So Sure. I, I met one of the organizers, and I, I actually wanted to help out this year, but I'm here, you know, doing this film. Um, but I asked him, I said, how many kids, because kids from the pro- from Astoria Projects have to walk past this wall, right. right? And I grew up with a lot of kids who were super talented artists but didn't have the social capital. And I was like, how many kids from the projects actually, is there a wall where kids from the projects can actually paint something? Mm-hmm. Well, No. Well, why not? Well, we haven't been able to find anyone. I was like, so none of these kids walking back and forth are dialoguing with you guys? It's like, well, have you tried the local high school, the local junior high, talk to the art department, mm-hmm. look at all the press that you've been getting? Wouldn't it be nice to connect it back to actual people in the community? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if some of these kids could pick up skills with the paint? Because now uh, one of the founders of, one of the co-founders of Mass Appeal uh, this guy, Adrian Moeller, has a business called, you know, Colossal mm-hmm. Murals, Sky High Murals, whatever. They do all this hand-painted advertising, which right. is something that had gone away. Yeah, Th- That's an actual trade now. People make money mm-hmm. doing it. Mm-hmm. Are any kids in the projects getting that trade? No. So, on one hand, yo, it looks cool. I know all the artists. Big up to all the artists who are, or, who are putting beautiful stuff in the community I grew up in. Mm-hmm. But... It's a double-edged sword. That yeah. that beauty is going to hurt a lot of people in the long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I find it interesting, like, you know, um, you you talked about in, in Fresh Dress, you know, uh, a, you know, kind of you touched on a bit about how, you know, hip-hop came out of the Bronx and what was going on in the Bronx at that time. And, <laughs> you know, if you, if you watch a movie like Rebel Kings, it digs into that in, in a lot more detail, right? And I think, you know, I've always believed that that happened because there was this tension. There was all this pent up emotion, the pent up creativity, right? That needed a way to to get out. And because the environment was so severe that it was like a powder keg, right? And it, it exploded to to the world. It was like, you know, it was like a supernova. Um, 
And so, you know, it kind of makes me wonder, like, can that happen again? You know, or, or, or does New York and the rest of the world, like, have the ability to be that creative and that, right, w- without, that, uh, without that kind of environment? Um, you know, I think all of that energy is moved to the web. Mm-hmm. Although, for instance, in Harlem, there's this, in the hood, there's always been this culture of, I don't know if it's the same in L.A., but kids doing wheelies on their bikes. Yeah. Not even, like, necessarily BMX tricks, mm. but, like, dudes wheeling for, like, 15 for like blocks. blocks yeah, yeah. And growing up in the 70s, that was the thing. And right. now there are, like, these crews uptown. You know, I live not far from Harlem. I live in Inwood, which is past Washington Heights. You have these kids who ride these SE bikes, these big mm-hmm. BMX cruiser-type bikes, and they wheelie, but they'll be 50 of them and they'll go on the highway oh wow and they just fucking wheelie that's crazy wheeling all you know i, I forget this one guy's name we just mass appeal just did a viral a video we just shot a video with him i wasn't there for the shoot but like wheeling everywhere throughout like the craziest stuff mm-hmm. it's a culture and what i appreciate about it is it's like kids and people young adults physically doing something in the real world yeah and Visually stimula- stimulating people, connecting with people. Like even if you think what they're doing is crazy or wow, mm-hmm. you're getting a, a direct sort of response from people, not sitting down behind your computer. Yeah, you know. So to me, that says if all these kids in Harlem and uptown can organize and rally behind this feeling they get from riding on their hind wheel for 20 blocks that says that there's still the potential for young people to channel their creativity in a positive way and inspire and influence other people. Okay. So I want to go back to you a little bit though. Um, Why, why did you start writing and, and how, how'd you become a journalist? Well, it goes back to graffiti. When I was a kid, I was really inspired by Phase 2 and a guy named David Schmidlap. They did a zine called mm-hmm. the, they call it, later it was called the International Graffiti Times or IGT, but Phase 2 had an epiphany where he felt like, uh, he calls it the G word, and it was a, he felt that graffiti was a derogatory term. Mm-hmm. So the zine morphed into IGHT, the International Get Hipped Times. And so... Schmidlap was 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 an older white dude who was a bit of a hippie and a leftist. So the zine consist, consisted of like this kind of like hippie leftist yeah uh rhetoric and graffiti, you know, or what Phase 2 would call aerosol art, uh subway stuff. And simultaneously I was on the the New York hardcore scene. And zines were popular. Right. And so those two things, coupled with a friend of mine named Chaka Malik, who wound up being in a lot of bands, he and this guy, Freddie Alva, there's a documentary that's coming out about this compilation they created called the New Breed Compilation. And what the New Breed Compilation was, was a cassette tape with lots of songs from like 12 different bands, a you know, singular, a compilation album with songs from different hardcore bands. Mm-hmm. And they had a booklet, a black and white printed booklet that fit in a, a like a plastic that you would put a comic in. Okay. So for ten bucks, you would get the the zine, which was like each page was representative of each band, and each band did original art, and they had the lyrics, mm-hmm. and they had the cassette, the New Breed Comp. They sold it for ten bucks. I saw that because Chaco was also a graffiti artist, and. Uh, I was inspired by the booklet so much so that I was like, yo, I want to do a zine. Who's your, pr- who's your printer? Mm-hmm. Um, so looking at that, looking at IGT, looking at other hardcore zines, I stepped to my mom in, you know, 1987, something like that. And I said, Ma, I need like $800. You know, for what? You know, I, I was into BMX, you know, for her... The right. biggest purchase she probably, you know, I got a mongoose. Mm-hmm. And the biggest purchase for her, for me, back then was my mongoose and getting 
you know, new parts, pegs, wheels and shit, all yeah. that stuff, right? Yeah. So she must have spent like six hundred bucks all in on my mongoose. So she was like, "What are you? What are you gonna do with this money?" I was like, "I need to do this, this magazine." And, you know, my mom was a bit of an entrepreneur herself, and eight hundred dollars was a lot of money to a single mom. Sure, but she found the money, and I did all the photography, did interviews, nice. laid it out myself, went to the printer printed it and i remember um going with a friend of mine this graffiti writer named hush who was a you know a white kid who grew up in forest hills that's what was great about graffiti like mm -hmm. you know we all came from different levels of class and 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 neighborhoods and so hush is this you know guy who is from forest hills and i'm from astoria from across the street from the projects and we're in his pizzeria he came with me to the printer and uh, the negatives, you know, what they used to sort of print the magazine, mm -hmm. they gave it to me in a box. They were still printing the magazine. It wasn't completely done. Like, oh, yeah. here, here's here's the negatives. You know, you can have them. And as graffiti writers, we used to carry box cutters. So I was cutting into the uh, the box to open up, to open it up to get the negative, and I accidentally cut into my hand, and so this scar right here. Oh shit. Um, I got that day and I remember it was the cut was so deep that I just saw like white mm -hmm. and it was white for about four seconds and then little speckles of blood came and then it just started shooting out of my hand. Um, so I, uh, my mom gave me the money and I did the zine and there was a store in Manhattan called Soho Zat and it was a combination of combination head shop slash comic store and they sold IGT there. Mm -hmm. So I knew if I went there, they would sell my little magazine. Right. I put it in a plastic just like the new breed compilation. I sold it for five bucks. All of a sudden I'm selling four or five hundred copies of this zine. Uh, simultaneously up the block was Henry Chalfont's studio. And the significance of that is graffiti writers from all over the world and all over New York City would go and knock on Henry's door. Right. Because for many years, he would just open up his studio and show kids his photographs. Yeah. So because that area was heavily trafficked by graffiti artists, around the corner was a place called Pearl Paint where people would get their art supplies and stuff. And there were lots of hardware stores on Canal Street that sold spray paint mm -hmm. or people would go to steal their spray paint. So it was the perfect kind of place for me to have a zine about graffiti and actually be a young entrepreneur. So at the time there was IGT out of California. There was a zine called ghetto art, mm -hmm. which a, a later was called can control mm -hmm. right around the same time as me, uh, Steve powers, who's a pretty well-known artist today. Espo had a zine called on the go mm -hmm. that he started. So that was it. There were no other zines. My zine was black and white. They were all right. black and white. Yeah. Um, kids from Dusseldorf, Germany would go to the Soho Zat and buy magazines. And then all of a sudden I'm getting pen pals from around the world. They all want New York City subway cars because mm -hmm. it's like trading cards. Right. You know? And so they would send me graffiti from Germany. And I'm like, whoa, people are doing trains? This is crazy. Yeah. You know? In 89, our subways kind of stopped. around. But in 89, around the world, this culture was being spread and continuing on. So I did that zine. I went to knock on Henry's door. Henry didn't open the door. This guy named Carl Weston opened the door. And Carl would go on to do this video magazine called Videograph. Oh, yeah. Which was the first. He basically went out with graffiti writers and videotaped all the crazy shit that they would do. Mm -hmm. So it was the first video magazine by graffiti writers for graffiti writers. So here I was hanging with Carl, who's you know five or six years older than me. He's a filmmaker. He's doing all this video. I have my zine. Then I used to do something called the Poetry Moment on Videograph, which was like really bad poetry, corny shit. But me, joke, me just being silly, me, me being 18, 19, being silly, yeah. people started recognizing me on the street. You know, so yeah. 
this this sort of being inspired by my peers, seeing what my friend Chaka did. Yeah. You know, I I introduced him to skateboard. He introduced me to hardcore. And at first I, I was like, wow, you know, I, I went to a hardcore show. It's all white people. And I'm like, how does this even work? You know? And he made me a mixtape of all these hardcore songs and these couple of songs stuck out. And I was like, yo, what band is this? He's like, yo, that's the Bad Brains. He's like, and they're white. I mean, they're black. Right. And when he told me that, it gave me this sort of sense of, uh, I felt confident. You know, mm. I'm in a mosh pit with all these white dudes that I normally wouldn't know. Mm -hmm. And I wound up being friends with a lot of these guys. And then it that helped me understand, like, the white dude who likes hardcore is is the same as a black dude who likes hip hop, right? But only back then, the, the hardcore guys really liked hip hop, so we had things to talk about. We were all from New York. Yeah, it was it was a movement of uh, you know working class people mixed in with rich kids from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You know, Chloe Sevigny, the, the actress. Mm -hmm. I know her brother Paul. Right. Because he was a graffiti writer, and he but he was also a hip hop dancer, and he'd go to clubs in New York, and we'd go stay at his house in Connecticut and go steal spray paint. Mm -hmm. Like being surrounded by all this culture that I could participate in, that's the most powerful thing for me. Like hardcore, there was another band called New York Hoods that Chaka put me up on, and I really liked the song. And Chaka was like, you know, we go to high school with him, right? I was like, a guy in our high school made this? Right. So. Yeah, I remember back then it was like, uh, we had we had DJs at our school that were, in, you know, had groups. And one of them was on the radio. And it, it, like, that was such a unbelievable concept mm -hmm. that, that some kid that we know could actually like make something. And, and that would be, quote unquote, real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's that's interesting. Stuff. Well, for me, it was a reaffirmation of what I was taught at home. Mm -hmm. You know, my sure. mom made stuff, my dad made stuff, but as a kid, how do you make stuff? Right. How do you make stuff that not only you care about but other people do? Yeah. And that's what graffiti and hip hop and hardcore did for me. It showed me that I could make things that other people might care about, and yeah. it brings me closer to other people. Yeah. So when we met, I guess it was a few years after that, right? And and uh, you know I was at Herb, and I was looking for new writers for some reason, and um, I forget how we. I mean, I think I met Elliot first, and then he introduced me to you, if I remember correctly. Probably might have been Brian Adams. It, it probably he, was Brian. Brian yeah. introduced me to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I didn't realize, like, I just felt like, you know, we hit it off and these dudes, like, got it. Like, they were, you know, you guys just knew what was up and whatever you're doing was cool. And then, you know, a few months later or a year later or whatever, you guys told me about Ego Trip. And um, so talk about how, like, how do you go from that to, I mean, you know, Ego Trip is, is fascinating because, uh I was just, you know, in, in my research that you only put out 13 issues, mm -hmm. which, you know, for most magazines or for, you know, for like uh, uh, sort of mainstream magazines, that's that's a year basically. Right. And but yet you guys had this huge, I think, impact on the culture and, you know, guys our age that were into hip hop, like everybody knows ego trip and it was you know i think it was meaningful to them mm -hmm. so talk about how that came together and and you know and how it played out because i think you know the story is really interesting sort of where it went from being a magazine yeah well after i did my zine the the graffiti zine which was called graphic scenes in explicit language i published a hip-hop newspaper called beatdown and I started that with a guy named Haji Akibade, who was my childhood friend, who was also like a young budding hip hop producer. And he knew Marley Marl and, and was kind of under Marley's wing and was producing tracks for people. Mm -hmm. um, 
he knew someone that his dad was like an accountant at WBLS. You know, Haji just had connects in the industry. I didn't know anybody in the industry. What I had was my creativity and my network of creative people. Mm-hmm. So we got together and did Beat Down Newspaper. Um, and we ran into Elliot. There was a, speaking of hardcore and hip hop coming together, a friend of mine promoted a bunch of shows. He put together a show with a, a hardcore band called Sick of It All and Boogie Down Productions. And so I asked her, hey, can we go and give out our newspaper at this show? She's like, great. So we're in there. Me and Haji are giving out newspapers. And then I run into Elliot. And then I talk to him for a few seconds. And then Haji talks to him for a few seconds. And I was like, I know that guy from high school. Where do you know him from? He's like, oh, I know him from college. You know, he's trying to holler at this girl I know or whatever. So back then, we didn't have beepers or anything. Back then, you can get a uh, like a, a voicemail. You pay a number. You pay uh-huh. for a phone number, and you can check your messages. Yeah. So the next day, we got a call from Elliot like, hey, you know, I want to write for you guys. And so Elliot came down and... You know, he was the music. He became the music editor at Ego Trip. I mean, excuse me, at Beatdown, and mm-hmm. um, that went for some issues. And then Haji and I had like a falling out. You know, it was uh, a lot of immaturity, a lot of insecurity, just real stupid stuff. And um, I stepped away, and because I was the guy who was kind of more friendly with the contributors, like. I knew all the people. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of stepped away with me. And ironically, I was going through a phase of trying to figure myself out, figure some things out, which involved like, you know, seeing a few different young ladies. And then I I wound up getting mono. And I was. As you do? Yeah. And I was down and out for a minute mm. you know about six months just out of it and trying to figure out what i'm going to do and elliot visited me elliot mr elliot wilson visited me back back you know back before he was famous and uh you know i i i was like man i've got to figure out what my next move is going to be he's like man we should do a magazine come on man and i was like okay but if we do a magazine, it can't be because I'm, then I'm thinking like advertising. I was like, all right, if we do another magazine, it can't be just like Beatdown, right? Because Beatdown is getting that ad money. Like right. Beatdown popped off because of Brian Adams uh, and Tommy Boy because we sold them the back cover back when the back cover meant everything. Yeah. So they bought the back. They gave us like eight grand for the back cover for the year, and we were printing newspapers that cost mm-hmm. us like six hundred bucks God, an nothing. issue. So yeah. I was like. Okay, I I know some of the advertisers. What are we going to do that's going to make what we're offering worth advertisers spending money with us? And then I was like, yo, if I'm going to do some magazine, it's got to be a real reflection of, like, me. You know, I was like, you've got hip-hop, but, like, I feel like the world is going to a place where there are going to be more people like me Mm. who like hip-hop, who like punk rock, who Mm -hmm. like skateboarding, who like all this stuff. So he was like, all right, cool. Um, the name Ego Trip, I, I I believe I should I Elliot gets credit for the name the actual name Ego Trip. Um and it's very interesting that he chose that name. But I digress. Um Did you did you think at all about um uh you know, how to be partners? I mean you guys are young at that no, time. No, we were you know, I I was coming off of my experience with Haji. Me and Haji are great. You know, are great. You know, we 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 grew up together, man. Yeah. And, and even Elliot, like, I have a lot of love for the guy because I know where he comes from. Mm-hmm. And and that was with me. It was never a conflict because I never had the same aspirations as him. Mm-hmm. And I always saw his victories as a victory for me. Mm-hmm. He knows that. Um, because I know where the hell he comes from. He went to the same shitty high school I went to. It's right. horrible. Um, so, but no, we're not thinking about how to be partners. We're just still learning about all kinds of stuff in life. Right. Um, of course. So, you know, uh, 
kind of throwing it back to Herb, I always respected Herb because it felt like Herb had its business together. I mean, I'm sure, you know, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle, but like you guys had like a cool office in you California and all these people working there and Raymond had motorcycles and shit. <laughs> like we weren't living like that and we weren't living like that in New York and LA man, we know how to build sets. We build a facade. Right. Where everything looks real cool. Well, look outside. man, it looks sexy and the truth about it, you know, none of us were necessarily business people. Right. You know, we didn't have I didn't have that kind of training at home. Yeah. You know, I didn't have that ex- experience. Um, so, so, so what? Ha- so, by the time Ego Trip, you know, a few years in, you had five partners, right? Well, it started out with me and Elliot, right? And then Chairman Mao, I met and I brought him aboard Beatdown. Mm-hmm. He actually okay. st- He stuck around. I I was an intern at a place called Third World Newsreel, and they do really important documentaries with folks of color and Mm -hmm. they're the ones who have all this really important footage of like the Panthers in the 60s they have all this really seminal important documentary stuff I was an intern there and they would always tell me about you got to meet this this Asian brother Jeff Mao he you know he loves hip-hop you guys really get along and one day I was in the elevator and I saw a Chinese dude with a Carhartt jacket and I was like you're Jeff Mao aren't you (laughs) he's like you're Sasha Jenkins so Jeff was a filmmaker you know he's a few years older than me and he was PAing and, and just working in, in, in film, you know, cutting his teeth. And so I met him there, right? So when Beatdown fell apart, though, Jeff stuck around at Beatdown for a little while because he wanted to continue to get his free uh, fucking, he's a DJ, so mm-hmm. he wanted to get his free records and yeah, stuff. I'm, sure. not, I'm not mad at him for it. He didn't really know us that well then. But then eventually when, when, me, and Elliot, when me and Elliot started at Ego Trip, it was like, we should bring the, you know, we should bring Mal along with us. You know, he really, he really gets it. And so we reached out to him. We're like, yo, come on, man. Like, don't roll with, with beat down. You got to roll with us. So he, so Mal came on. So right. initially it was me and Elliot and then Mal. And then Rap Pages was happening. Yeah. And they had a, they had a column called Underground Zine where they would feature, you know, mm-hmm. zines and stuff. And mm-hmm. so, uh, Gabe Alvarez reached out to us like, hey, we want to write about your zine. So we're like, cool. So he interviewed us and we had a great conversation. And it was like, we'd love to get you to write for Ego Trip. So I believe he started writing for Ego Trip. We had no money. And then he gave us the opportunity to write for Rap Pages. And mm-hmm. he actually paid us. He had money. So we became good friends with with Gabe. And then... We were doing a Cypress Hill cover story for for Ego Trip, and this is right around the time of the, the quote unquote L.A. riots or the uprising. Ironically, I'm doing a film about that right now. Yeah. But um, so Miguel Baguer, who was the publicist at Sony Records, is like, "Hey, you want to interview Cypress Hill? You want to put him on the cover? Yeah, why wouldn't we want Cypress Hill? All right, we'll take care of your plane tickets, right? So I don't, me and Elliot, like we we didn't even know how to drive." Right. And we came to L.A. and we met Gabe mm-hmm. and Brian Cross, who did the photography mm-hmm. and Brent. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we 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 hit it off. And then eventually we're like, Gabe, move to New York, man. You want to move to New York? Come to New York. Like, let's do ego trip. Let's really do this. Right. We had no money. Uh, we had some money to pay him. He wound up moving to my mom's house in Queens. My mom. Oh, wow hosted him yeah. you know this is the woman who gave me the money for my first scene yeah, yeah. i said ma i gotta hold down my man who's coming out here and making the sacrifice he stayed there for a little while as we were getting our stuff together and then yeah. you know we wanted to step up the look of the magazine this woman christine Shar, who was a friend of ours was doing it you know she's a really talented artist but she had a lot going on mm-hmm. and we wanted to step up the look and feel of the magazine. So it was like Brent is like a next level genius in the game. And so we somehow convinced him to come out too. I mean, he, he was doing well as a graphic designer as well. So mm-hmm. he was able to take a leap of faith and come out here and come to New York and start a new life. And that's how Ego Trip came together. And um, yeah. I, I, I equate it to being in a band in a very fertile period Mm -hmm. like i couldn't have done that without those guys you know going back to what i said about 
selecting your team. Right. Like a a a, a Mexican cat from LA, half black, half Vietnamese guy from LA, Chinese cat from, you know, Massachusetts. Elliot Wilson, who's black, Greek, and Ecuadorian from Queens. And then me, you know, my mom's from Haiti, my dad from Philly, and all kinds of other folks, all kinds of other stuff swimming through my blood. Uh And we were all kind of weirdos. We're all a little different. We all were willing to make sacrifices. You know, we were all willing to collaborate with one another. It was very collaborative, man. We would get behind a computer. It was like, who's going to drive? And someone would start writing and mm-hmm. someone would dictate and then we would all write this stuff. We took turns. It yeah. was it was um it took a group of very special guys who were at a moment in their lives with where they were willing to be humble mm-hmm. to create something greater than them. Mm-hmm. And that's what Ego Trip was. Well, you know, I mean I, you said a couple of things that, that I think are fascinating and you know, it's hard to imagine when, you know, we think of hip hop today, it's this global phenomenon that's big business, that's, you know, it's, it's, it moves markets and it's all about money, right? But, you know, going back then, it was like this tiny little, I mean, there was big, you know, there was, this is after Run DMC and NWA and Public Enemy and Beastie Boys and, you know, you know, Ice T was a movie star already, right? But, but it was still this tiny little culture, in the scheme of things, right? And to this point where, you know, we all kind of knew each other. It was like, you know, I brought you guys on to write for Herb. You guys had me write for Ego Trip. You know, Brent did my first club flyer when I was still in college, um, and you know, we went to school together and that's how we knew each other. And like, but it, there was just this thing of everybody kind of knew each other and every, you know, Brian Adams is just connecting people, you know, all over the country. And, um, you know, I wonder, you say it's like this moment for you guys, but I think it's also this moment for that culture when that kind of thing could just happen, right? That I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to get too nostalgic, but like, I don't know if that kind of thing happens anymore. Well, you know, I have, you know, my 19-year-old, there's a a young lady who was just in our house for a month. Might be a bit of a long time, but Mm. she's an artist from the UK, uh, phenomenal talent, uh, singer, songwriter, guitarist. They met online, you know? They hadn't met each other. Sure. And the idea was, you know, maybe she'll stay a few days and then we'll figure out if we even like each other, but they wound up being very cool. And, and, and she stayed, you know, she's still at, you know, I'm, she's still at my house, but, uh, <laughs> um, so I see it manifesting through social media to us. Right. I mean, I can't relate to it. I'm not on any, I'm officially personally not on any social media platforms. And I met a woman last night who, um, she wound up, she's a friend of a good friend of mine and she had this space that we rented today to do interviews mm. and we were talking about something. She's like, you're not on Instagram? And she, with a very, with a straight face, she's like, how do you live? <laughs> and I'm like, yo, I don't want you to know what the fuck I ate this morning. Right. I don't want you to know what music I listen to. I don't want you to know that I was on the roof with Norwood f- from Fishbone interviewing him. I'm not documenting what I'm doing during the day mm-hmm. because it's for me. It's not for you. But the world has changed, right? And so when she said very sincerely, how do you live? Yeah. I don't take that lightly because I know that the way people communicate now is different. And I'm a little out of step. Yeah. You know, um, the only thing that keeps me in step is I have the privilege of doing some projects that people, hopefully a lot of people get to see. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that keeps, you know, if I, if I wasn't doing some of the stuff that I'm doing as a, as a, as a human being, not participating in social media is like, uh, she said, how do you live? And so I see how people live now. All these things that you talked about, 
about how we came together, how we shared. Right. People are doing it. Yeah. It's just, um, it's a lot less personal. Mm-hmm. You know, when people are so tied into, li- you know, someone putting a little heart on a photograph, it's just like, and people take that seriously. Well, how many likes do you have? Right. I don't have any likes. You know, you might not like me. And, and it took me years to realize that, like, some people just don't like me, you know? That used to hurt my feelings, used to make me sad. I used to always want, and that's a part of me just growing. Like, I always wanted, I'm not saying I don't want people to like me now. I'm saying it was very important to me to have people like me for many years. Okay. Now, I it's it's like, part of it is chemical. Sometimes people just don't like you because they just don't. They don't like the way you look. They don't like the way you speak. They don't like what you're about. You know what? That's fine. You don't have to like me. It's cool. You know, but... The world is so tied into likes and being liked. But what is that? Why do people get so swept up in, damn, I, I'm not getting enough likes? And, and I, I always ask my wife and my, my, my daughter, like, they'll show me a photo and it drives them nuts. I always say, hey, how many likes does it have? And they get so mad at me because they're like, yo, you don't know. You sound, they're like, you sound stupid. But part of it is they know I'm stepping to them. Right. And they know it, but the world has changed. Yeah, that's funny because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't think that about you. That, and again, you know, that's judging. I think from a lot of your work, that um, you know, because Ego Trip was like, you know, it was silly, goofy, like irreverent memes. Like for sure, I didn't even understand what a meme was until recently. Yo, we used to take photos of planet of the apes mm-hmm. and write like yeah. you know don't hate on a player or whatever right. you know like we were doing that before anybody yeah and that to me you know it was very you know it stood in contrast to i think the 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 zeitgeist of hip-hop right which is about how tough everybody is or how much money everybody has or like there are these themes that played out you know and you know I, and i think ego trip that's what people appreciated about it was that it was it was its own thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and I, I found it interesting. So, you know, to tell the story. Right. So you you guys did the magazine. And then, you know, next thing I know, there's TV shows, there's books, there's like, you know, it looks like it's becoming a multimedia empire. Um, looks like it. Yeah. So so talk about that. Uh yeah, well, for us, it was very simple. Like, um, e- you know, again, bringing it back to this idea of Ego Trip being a band, it was really about, like, where the group passion was, right? And so the group passion was to do this book called The uh, Book of Rap Lists, mm-hmm. right? Um, Jeff Mao I, and and probably Elliot, you know, Mao was really inspired by this uh, Book of Rock Lists. I think Dave Marsh, yeah. Rolling Stone, um, <clears throat> you know, those guys are, you know, Mal has all these records. Elliot had a lot of records. Those guys, the way their minds work are so devoted. Like I look at myself as like the culture guy at Ego Trip, okay. like graffiti and uh-huh. b-boying and like, like the essence of like where it all came from. Like that was my role, but hey. like the super nerd out record i know everything about everything like sure. those two guys as chairman it's chairman and, and it's elliot okay and the, and and their relationship they love that they love to talk about that you know i just kind of like what i like but the consensus was like hey let's do this book so we all got together and did that book mm-hmm. and I, th- I believe it came out in 99 and it was for the time and you know, people really dug it you know yeah. um it was exhaustive. It had lots of lists. All these things that you see today. Right. Many of these things you see on Complex. Sure. Noah Callahan Bever was our intern. Right. That's a whole other conversation. Um, so we do that book, and then it has success. And then we're always thinking about, because we didn't have resources, right? What can we do? What project can we do next that's going to set us up for other stuff? Right. So Ego Trip wasn't just about music. It was about race and and humor and all these other things. So we were like, 
let's do something that speaks more towards that. Let's like not just get pigeonholed by rap mm -hmm. or music. Let's expand and, and really connect with our identities. You know, Ego Trip was really, uh, you know, I laid out the diversity within the ranks, within the five of us. It was, Ego Trip was a reflection of us, of us exploring our identities and figuring out how we fit in to America. Sure. You know. So was there ever, was there a moment, was there a big break? Or was it just like a, you know, one little thing after another? Um, like, did you guys ever sit there and go, oh, shit, we're like, we're, we're good. A big break. What do you mean? Like a big break amongst us or a big break like as an opportunity? Can yeah, it's an opportunity. Like, did you ever feel like you got to it, like you made it? Well, that's part of my th problem, which I guess it's not bad, but I never feel like I've made it ever. Okay. You know, and I never felt like we made it. Although when we did the White Rapper show, that was the first time when I felt like, wow, I have some kind of authority. This is a multi-million dollar production. Yeah. And my ideas count. And I'm we're all leading the charge right. in the creative. If you look at the, uh, it's like if you know us and you see the stuff that we've created, you can see all of us inside of these projects. And But what we shared was this sense of like being folks of color and having this perspective and this sort of, this, this perspective and, and this stance on how we saw the world. Mm -hmm. We were all on the same page with that. And, and the humor was also an extension of that. And so since our sensibilities were similar when it came to humor, right. we could all do that. And then all the other stuff that came with it was just the icing on the cake. It was just all of us coming together and doing something and not, not being conscious of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. you know. So, But when the White Rapper Show happened, that was the moment where like people would come up to us on the street or like people would quote you know right. the rappers or sure. the ratings were amazing you yeah. know we got great ratings so yeah. that felt like we can go somewhere but even in, in that moment I wasn't and it, maybe it was a mistake none of us were really like okay how do we take this moment Right. And really maximize it. And I think it was because we were all very, with those guys, it's all about, like, they're very anal. I think I brought, like, I'm not anal always. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very loose with what I do. Mm -hmm. And I benefited from sure. these anal dudes. Yeah. Um, so with, with, with the group, the group mentality is it has to be perfect. And when everything aligned and, 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 and something was perfect, we had this, like, this sense of like, achievement. Mm -hmm. But also that strong sense of like, making sure everything was perfect made things go slow. Right. And made people sure. kind of like second guess or... Make, made people stumble in terms of the decisions they made. I mean, even me, like, the the next book we did was The Big Book of Racism, and that was coming off of 9-11. Mm -hmm. And I was the one in the room. There's five of us. It's like, dude, I don't know if we should do this right now, man. It's a, you know, it's a crazy time right now. Yeah. I, I don't know how people are going to rock with this. Yeah. And it was the group who was like, nah, man, we're going to do this. We're going to do this shit. And... They were right. If we didn't do that, you know, that led to the White Rapper Show, mm -hmm. which even before that, we did a, sh a series called Race Arama, right. you know, where we had a show called Dude, Where's My Ghetto Pass? And like a show called Blackophobia, you know, uh, about black people's own fear of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was the, 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 the power of groupthink and everyone kind of playing a position and everyone agreeing to move it's almost like those costumes that are like a horse right there's like two people it's yeah. like 
if they're not going in the same direction, it's just the horse looks stupid, right? right? Except you got five people. Right. Yeah. So it's just a horse with a fat ass. So um, so that so what did you learn? That partnership is is over. Mm-hmm. Well, Eco Trip still exists. Okay. There's a website. Yeah. Um, and you know uh, a Twitter, a Twitter, and you know it's still it's still active, and uh-huh. I'm actually looking at you know ways to uh, bring new life into what it is okay. and what it's been because I believe Ego Trip still has an audience and, and a value. Right. I think it could use new blood to kind of push it into the 22nd century or whatever century we're in. Sure. Um, but, but but it's not the five of you in a room no. working the shit out anymore. No. So, so tell me, give me some lessons. What did you learn from that experience specifically about partnerships, about business? Like what, what did you take away from Well, that? business has to be business and not personal Mm. you know i think that we because everyone invested so much of their heart and soul and their passion right into what it was that we were doing and we didn't invest in the just nuts and bolts of like the unemotional function of business right so to me that's the biggest biggest takeaway and Admittedly, it's hard not to be emotional because it's not like we're dealing with pork bellies Mm -hmm. or solar energy. We're dealing with things that are like, um, for me, you know, this is the culture that informed that here I am 40 something and I'm still doing things that are connected to what I did as a kid. Yeah. So it's hard for me to, it's easy for me to say like, well, we should have been less, more business and more, you know, less personal. But it was personal, it was art to us, mm-hmm. you know. Um, who, are, who are the people you, that you think do, do that well, do both really well? Who are the people who do art and music, art and culture, art and business really well and who mm-hmm. are successful? I mean, mm-hmm. it's twofold. Like a guy like Damon Dash, I respect because... If you really look at some of the projects he's been involved with, like he knows culture, man. He's mm-hmm. the guy who brought culture to that whole organization. Guy was a visionary, but not necessarily the best at interpersonal relationships. Sure. Right? A guy like Jay Z is he's the guy who said he, you know, he couldn't see it coming from his eyes, so he had to make the song cry. That's a real strong metaphor for who he is. You know, he is about his business Mm -hmm. he's unemotional you know he doesn't let his well i guess he stabbed lance on rivera over leaking his his album or whatever so i guess he maybe he was emotional completely unemotional right but i think he got over the emotions and has been able to have a level of success in business and maintain a level of artistic integrity at least people still seemingly care about what he makes for sure so what about do you have are there models that you look to for your own success or do you have mentors that have helped you along the way well henry chalfont yeah. has been like uh i mean my wife is also extremely tight with him she's finishing a film with him right now mm-hmm. um that guy was you know n- not only to me but to a lot of inner city kids was like a dad and not only a dad in just being able to, I mean, I was, I was a PA on a film he did called flying cut sleeves, which is a precursor to rebel Kings. Okay. You know, I was on set when he was interviewing these gang members in 1988. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a credit on a seminal film that tells the story of hip hop I got that credit in 1988. Mm -hmm. So, and that was through my association with Henry. So he not only was just there as an older person that I could have real conversations with, he gave me real opportunity that years later continues to open doors for me. What do you think, besides the opportunity, what do you think you learned from him? Well, he's another person who has... 
an eye for 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 art and culture. Yeah, you know he's he's from Pittsburgh. He was an older white guy. He came from privilege. Mm-hmm. You know that's not a secret, and but he but he understood that these inner city kids were trying to say something so much so that he just started. It's not like he called up the Times and said, I'm going to start taking photos. It's not like he was even a photographer. He wasn't. He just picked up a camera because he felt that what was being done on the subways was important. Right. And it, it, he had been taking photos for a couple of years before he met any of these kids. Mm-hmm. People thought he was a cop. No mm-hmm. one understood what was going on. And finally, you know, I think it was uh, Carlos Mayor Rodriguez who came up to him, had a conversation with him, and then was like, well, what, what's your deal? And then, you know, Henry started forming real relationships with, with these kids. You know, here's this older white man who's not out for anything bad, who understands art history because he was an artist himself. So he was a sculptor. You know, mm-hmm. he's, he's a highly educated man who's saying, hey, guys, I see what you're doing and I see how important it is, so much so that I'm taking photos of it. And this is before... You can do everything with your phone, including wipe your ass. You know, photo. You know, right. thirty-five millimeter photography was not sure. something kids in the hood had access to. So here was this guy who f- actually pioneered a technique because he would take, if you know, he would take uh, like three photographs of the train and splice them together. That mm-hmm. way, he could get up closer. Because mm-hmm. if you're up real close on the train, you can't get the whole train. Right. So instead of taking the train on an angle, he would get up real close. And take three or four shots, splice them together. Yeah. So then you were able to see the full detail of the car. Like, mm-hmm. that's amazing. It, if Henry hadn't done that, I mean, there's a guy named Jack Stewart who took photographs before Henry and, and, and did a, a lot of important work. But Henry took the photography to another level. You know, so his contribution and, and, and what he gave back to the culture and and not just being a mentor, but being a pioneer is still being felt today. Mm-hmm. So what, what's the, what's the goal now? So now you're, you, so you're, you're, you're making films. You're, you're on a film right now. I don't know if you want to talk about that or if we're keeping that under wraps. Uh, well, I'm doing two films. One of them I can talk about. I'm, I'm, I'm rapping one film called Word is Bond, okay. which is about rap lyrics, you know, the, the art of writing lyrics. Yeah. You know, uh, I interviewed, I went to Kansas City and got with Tech 9 Nice. I went to Philly and got with Freeway. We got with J. Cole, um, a woman named Rhapsody who's really good. Uh, a broad range of lyricists, Anderson Pac. Mm-hmm. You know, to just tell the story of, well, where does it all come from? And is it respected? Yeah. And when you stop to consider, you know, a lot of these inner city kids who look to rap as a way out, who go to, some, you know, really horrible schools and don't have the best education, when you really think about the fact that they are manipulating language, mm-hmm. they're using words and creating new words and new worlds and yeah. changing their realities you know, people who have been written off. So uh, that film is about a week or two away from being finished. Okay. And, uh, where is that coming? Where is it coming? Well, actually, we, um, Sprite, I got Sprite, we got Sprite to pay for it. And um, they have a, a campaign called Obey Your Verse where they put, you know, rap lyrics. You know, they've got this year, they've right, got J. Right, Cole right. and... Missy and um, Tupac. Yeah. But our whole thing was like, listen, if you do a film that really speaks to the power of lyrics and where it comes from, Mm -hmm. that'll really say something to the consumer. And they let me make a film and they left me alone. So, so talk about that. How do you, how do you choose projects? Like what, what what do you need from a topic to want to make a film about? Well, for me, it starts with, like with Fresh Dressed, it was a backdoor way of telling the history of hip-hop, right? Not just fashion. It was just using fashion as a platform to get into bigger issues, Mm -hmm. you know, 
to get into the things that created hip hop. Mm-hmm. Hip hop is a reaction and reflection, a reaction to and a reflection of society at large. So I try to, uh, I identify projects that I want to work on based on what is its actual connection to real people okay. and subcultures and how do these worlds that people don't know much about fuel the world at large. And so that's what Fresh Dressed, I hope, is. And I'm hoping that uh, Word is Bond does the same thing, gives people a window into, well, who are these people who write these lyrics? And no, I don't know anything about hip hop, but like, I want to have a better understanding of what inspires them. I mean, they curse all the time. You know, whatever. People sure. have all these preconceived yeah. notions on who these people are. But I think in the process of hearing their stories, you hear about the environments that they come from. Mm-hmm. And without identifying specific moments and saying, listen to the message, the message is there. And if, you, if you're if you open to it and receptive to it and you pick up on it, great. If you don't pick up on it, it's fine, too. You'll still hopefully be entertained by what I put together. Mm-hmm. And then, and what about brands? So I know you say you worked with Sprite on this. Um, wh- what is it? You know, obviously brands are chasing this culture. Some do it pretty well, and a lot of them don't. Um, so, what do brands? What do brands need to know? Well, a brand like Sprite. Um, it, they've been around they've actually been supporting hip hop since like the 80s yeah. you know so a brand like that uh that has given back to the culture to a certain extent mm-hmm. um is a desirable partner um for me a, a brand has to have a certain level of connectivity or responsibility before I would want to create something okay. with them. Mm-hmm. And again, the Sprite thing, and we're going to wind up with a network partner mm-hmm. um, to get it out there. Um, so ultimately everyone wins. You know, Sprite is associated, even though there's not one mention of Sprite in the film outside right. of obviously their title card, which they deserve, and right. I'm very thankful for, for them giving us the shot to do this. But um, it's not really a commercial for Sprite. It's a commercial for... It's not a commercial. It's a film about what it is that they're looking to tap into, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 helping them better understand this subculture that they want to tap into and what what lyrics really mean. Like, okay, you're you believe in hip hop enough that you're going to put lyrics on the cans. Let's under let's peel it all back and understand why lyrics mean so much to people. Why people want to debate about uh, Drake and Meek Mill and who's writing stuff and whatever. Right. Like, if it was just pop music, no one's arguing over, well, Britney ain't write that shit. You know what I'm saying? No one would ever, who would ever say that about right. pop music, but it it shows you how important lyrics are in hip hop because your word is your bond. Mm-hmm. What you say, uh, people expect you to live by it and stand behind it. Yeah, is that a fair, I mean, I, you know, I had AMG on the show, and we were talking about... That's your guy from way back. Yeah, yeah, that's my man. Um, but we were talking about that, like, is that, I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, <coughs> our opinion on this, but is that a fair expectation, right, that, you know, rappers, and I'm guilty of it, that, you know, I'm always kind of let down when I find out that the that the, the lyrics are just... You know, that's just some shit that he wrote. You know what I mean? Or or somebody wrote, right? That it that it's not that it's you know, it's in the first person, but it's not really right. what he's going through. Yeah. Um but we but we don't have that expectation of pop stars or of movie stars or of, you know, so many other public figures. Well, I think it's because hip hop is cl- rap music is closely associated with African Americans. And African Americans have so little ownership in America okay. that the one thing that folks take pride in and expect is we're being oppressed for our, for our identities, so own that shit mm-hmm. and control it right. and don't front. 
don't be ashamed. Be honest. Yeah. Hip hop rap supposed to be about honesty and about standing up. You know, uh, but it's the music has evolved. It's about pop. It's about popular culture now. Right. It's about connecting ideas to as many people as possible. Cause like the reality is like, all right, you're gonna rap about your hood and all that other stuff. You know, I was just on Grape Street, you know. Um I had I was with a gentleman named Akila Shirelles, who is a former gang member and, and now does amazing, amazing things to change people's lives. You know, he's still in the hood. Mm-hmm. He still can go anywhere he wants. These people are right. his friends. They're his family. Yeah. Um, I'm losing track. What, what were we talking about? Just like, you know, the expectation of rappers to, oh, yeah. to keep it real. So. When I interviewed him for this other film I'm doing, like, he wasn't dressed like a gang member. Right. You know, uh, he had a straw hat on and, like, a really nice polo shirt and, like, chancletas, Mm -hmm. you know? And I'm in, you know, Jordan Downs projects. Right. You know? Is he he less gangster? No. Right. Because he's authentic. He's from there. He's... It's not... It's not uh, something that's packaged to entertain people, but like, okay, you're from the hood and you're rapping about how things are fucked up and police brutality and all this stuff. If you're a white kid, you know, of privilege, I guess to a certain extent, it's it, you know, it's it's entertaining or 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 it's 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 scary and there's something about it that draws you in. But at a certain point, like. You know, if you're Uncle Murda or some some rapper who does this like really core stuff, you can't really expect like the world to want to buy your records, right? Because it's too real, right? Not everyone wants reality. Sure, people want music as an escape. Mm-hmm. There are some people from the hood who probably don't want to listen to rap because it's too depressing for them because right. they want to go beyond that, and that's fine. Like. And that's what popular music does. Mm-hmm. That's the purpose it serves. Serves and rap, a, a, a faction of it, a percentage of it, has become really popular music. Mm-hmm. And so, rappers who are popular have people helping them writing their rhymes. But what are they rhyming about? Like, if if people are complaining about Drake not ry- writing his rhymes, let's think right. about it. I don't know Drake's music. Yeah, I I, I know I'm that sure it's great. Yeah, no, he seems like a nice guy, you know, who um, had a, a, a decent upbringing and is not a dummy, right? Right. But I don't know, is he rapping about gangster stuff? Like, if he is, he probably shouldn't do that. He right. probably can have great success rapping about, like, he's a handsome guy, he likes girls, he, he's emotional, Something tells me that's what he's talking about. Right. So then yeah. he's good. So yeah. if, if if Drake is in the lane where he's not fucking rapping about some shit that he knows nothing about, right. why do I fucking, why do you care if he's not writing it? You care because rap is so closely tied into authenticity and, and identity because black people in America don't own shit mm. that... We feel like we don't own shit, but we own this. Fuck you. Don't try to come in here. You're not from here, Drake. You're not from fucking Grape Street. What the fuck are you talking about? Mm-hmm. You know? So if you want to if you want to measure Drake on on that scale, if he's doing rapping about stuff that's like some ignorant shit, some thug shit that he shouldn't be, that's kind of problematic, but if he's just rapping about pop shit, who fucking cares if he's not writing his rhymes? Mm-hmm. I I don't, but I'm old. What do I know? I'm an old man. <laughs> I don't think anybody cares. I think, you know, people cared for like three days. And it's over. Yeah, I think that was, So no. Meek Mill was the loser. Yeah, he lost that for sure. Right. For Meek, sure. what do you care, bro? Like, you got Nicki Minaj. You're living your life, man. <laughs> like... You Life's know, good for you. Is, but, you know, that's part of hip-hop, too, right, is there's supposed to be battles, there's supposed to be beef, you know, and and I think, you know, for me, like, that was a weird clashing of two cultures, right, because what? that that whole 
Meek Mill. Meek Mill thing, right? Because it was like, on the one hand, trying to stay rooted in the past of like, you know, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna battle, I'm gonna dethrone you, right? And yet, in this pop environment where no one gives a shit, and it's just a, it was just a weird like juxtaposition. It brought those two things really close together, where we don't always see that. Well, it also shows how the the world is changing. Yeah. It's like. You can bark all this gangster shit, but who can't? Like, right. no one wants that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so what about um, uh, back to the brand thing? Like, is there stuff that you walk away from? Is there something that is, you know? Do you ever does selling out enter the equation for you? I mean, it, you know, it depends on what the project is. It's like if you're producing stuff for television, it's supported by advertisers right. that you might not rock with. Yeah. I don't like cigarettes. Yeah. That's just me. Yeah. Sasha Jenkins. I'm partners in a in a you know in, in, in a company called Mass Appeal. Um, we have a magazine and a website. We do film and television, and we do marketing. Mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily always on the marketing side, but I don't I don't like smoking. I'm not down right. with it. I think it's ignorant. It's not for me. I personally would never promote anything involved with smoking. Mm-hmm. Never. That's just me. If if Camel or, or, or if some brand came along, a, a cigarette ba- brand, and said, I want to sponsor your film about rap, I wouldn't do it. Okay. That's not to say Mass Appeal wouldn't do it. No, I get it. But I'm saying I personally would not do it. Yeah. I don't need to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, how are we doing? Oh, we're, we're going to get kicked out in a minute. Um, okay. Last couple questions. What are what do you think have been the biggest sacrifices that you weren't expecting to make? The biggest sacrifices I wasn't expecting to make. Um well I never really played it safe, you know? I have a sister who went to Cornell. I have cousins that went to Brown and other prestigious universities. I never finished. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wound up getting a fellowship to the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia um, on the strength of my knowledge of graffiti. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's scary. I've been scared over the years. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I, I don't, what are my skills? You know, I, I don't I, I don't have I don't have like a my education, I think, is really strong, but it's not traditional. Right. And luckily, I've been able to create and work on projects that exhibit a high level of. Assumed education. Mm-hmm. Right. So now. I know how to do this. I, I've done. Oh, no one. You know, no one at CNN asked me if I had a college degree. Yeah, nobody's checking your GPA. Not right now, but you know, I, my mom, who's who's an immigrant, you know, to this day is like, "Oh, when are you gonna go get your college degree?" Sure. You know, and maybe one day that'll be in the cards. But you yeah, know, I, th- I mean, I think that's called imposter syndrome. What is that? That's where you put that on yourself that you're not qualified or not at a certain level regardless of all your accomplishments and your and your obvious ability. Right. But I think it's also tied into the realities of being a black man in America. Okay. You know, going, bring it back to being in Watts the other day, you know, uh, there's a restaurant called Local owned by, co-owned or co-founded by a chef named Roy Choi. Yeah, he's been on the show. Who is just a, a fantabulous man and... You know, Akila Shirelles, who I just mentioned to you, is also a partner in this restaurant. It's in Watts. And they employ over 40 people from the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And many of these cats have never had legitimate jobs. Mm-hmm. Not because they didn't want them, but because there haven't been jobs in that community mm-hmm. in a long time. And so when a 35-year-old guy who is making fast food that's actually healthy says to me, I'm so happy to have this job. Yeah. You know, um, I, 
I take so much pride in this job. I think about the simplicity of that. And I think about where I come from and where so many people where I came from are like these guys as well. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I got choked up. You know, I actually I cried, you know, uh, leaving there because it's just so yeah. powerful that yeah. someone like Roy working with people in the community to give people a shot who don't who don't always have a shot. And I'm on airplanes a lot and sometimes I'm in meetings that I'm surprised that I'm in. What am I doing here? But there's always a sense of like, well, what are you really doing here? Mm. And it's never it's never gotten in the way or stopped me from doing things, but it's in it's it's there, you know. I I deal with things that uh, I was just joking with my friend Noah about. He was telling me about Black Airbnb mm. that they had to create one. I was like, dude, did I just tell you about my experience with fucking like Airbnb? In theory, is a, is a beautiful idea. I've, stayed in places around the world that have been great yeah and it was easy for me to press a button and get find a place in the uk or in belgium right but suddenly recently i found myself trying to find places for me and my family f over for a holiday weekend and all these people were fronting on me is that right yeah oh shit. it was some like some racism shit wow and it's like you don't know you know what i'm saying right. like what are you basing this on? Yeah. Do you know me? Do you know what I do yeah. or what I'm capable of doing? Have you ever had a conversation with me? But it's not a hotel. It's Airbnb. So if you don't want black motherfuckers in your house, right. I guess you don't have to have them. But it's really, um, and, I, and, 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 and it's really, uh, it sounds really trivial, but when you have credit and you have money and you want to go someplace and you're being denied because of your race in 2016, sure. even if it's Airbnb, yeah. it's a strange feeling. I'm sure. So I'm going to start a stock photo business. We sell white photos for your Airbnb profile. I think some people, but see, there's something called Instant Book, which I learned okay. now where it's got a little lightning bolt, which basically means if you oh, got yeah, instant yeah, book, you just, you're not racist. Right, right, right. You don't give a fuck. You want right. money. So now <laughs> it's easier for me to focus on instant book. Or you book. are racist, but you just want money more. But here's the thing. Now that I know instant book exists, right. I don't want to deal with the feeling of maybe yeah. someone's going to front on me. So now I'm socialized to just look for instant book. Right. Where there's a whole world of people who probably would potentially rent to me. But now I'm shutting myself off because of those experiences and that's yeah. a that's a yeah that's crazy. A, a kind of a real life metaphor for what it's like to be black mm. and have little things like that tip you off to feel a certain way and to push you to move in ways that are other people don't have to think why the fuck do i have to think like this crazy yeah that's messed up all right um give us a favorite documentary Oh man, I, I never have an answer for that. Uh, the favorite documentary, uh, Style Wars by okay. Henry Chalfant. You know, uh, I when I did Fresh Dressed, I, I, I said I want to try to do a Style Wars for fashion, and by no means is Fresh Dressed Style Wars. Fresh Dressed is great. Um, I appreciate your kind words. Style Wars is one of the greatest documentaries of all time. My film is not on that level, but I was definitely inspired by Style Wars. You know, the characters, the folks in that film are so, again, Henry and, and Tony Silver, rest in peace. You know, uh, they saw, they knew who the characters were. Mm -hmm. You know, people coming out of hip hop, coming out of the culture are big personalities. That's my yeah. secret. You know, I'm doing these films inside of these worlds, these people are all huge personalities. It's not like I'm, I'm, not, it's, I'm not that special. I just yeah. know that these people are. Sure. Do you have a favorite DJ? You know, I had an experience with me and my wife were in, uh, not Germany, we were in Austria. Mm. And we randomly went to see Kid Koala. Okay. 
and it was a borderline religious experience. Yeah, he's crazy. He had like four turntables. Yeah. I had never seen anything like it. And that's a good one. No one's no one's mentioned Kid Koala yet. That's I great. don't know why. He's sick. I uh I had never seen anything like it yeah. uh since. And there's a, actually a, a a rapper named Edon mm-hmm. who I'm a huge fan of his, but he can rap and DJ. He can oh, rap wow. and cut and scratch. Yeah. Like at the same real. time. That to me is is uh phenomenal. But you know, I uh, Prince Paul, you know, actually, we have a a project called uh, Super Black. Okay. Uh, music. Um, Prince Paul, uh, as a DJ and as a producer, is just uh, so far ahead of his time that mm-hmm. he's still ahead of the game. People are still trying to catch up with him. Um, Paul Paul's, you know, also great, but Koala... Maybe because I love animals is koala got me open, so. Nice. Yeah. Sasha, thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate all your wisdom. Oh, thanks, man. Dropping it on us. Um, what should we promote? Watch Fresh Dressed. It's, it's on Netflix. Watch Fresh Dressed. Uh, go to YouTube and type in The Wilding Incident. Okay. That's my hardcore band. Okay. Got my man Noah in the house right now. It's named after the uh, Central Park Five, you know, these five brown black and brown cats who went to prison for a heinous crime that they didn't commit um what else did you look out for massappeal.com massappeal.com you can look out for that sometimes we do a print edition of the magazine and uh look out for lots of hearts just just start putting hearts like <laughs> when you next time you like have a really delicious burger like pull Drop out a heart, heart put yeah. like put a heart like a real heart like a like a paper mache heart like next to your burger and take a photo of it. I'm gonna look for you on Snapchat. Yeah, I'll be there, dude. Thanks again, man. Uh, yeah, come back, man. Next time we promoted something. Thank you, man. So. Okay, that was my man, Sasha Jenkins. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. He has some good stories. We got some good stories coming up next week. Champagne Drip will be our guest in studio. Stay tuned for that one. And meanwhile, don't forget to support our sponsors. Peace.